You know, there's a, there's a trouble with doing this every single year. Um, when we come back and we revisit the same truth over and over and over again, um, when we brush up against the things of God again and again, uh, it can make us numb. It, it, it can make us like where, where we, don't, we don't feel in our bones the way we maybe used to feel it uh, anymore, right? Do you realize there, there are things in the Bible, there are, there, are, there are truths that we believe, if you're a follower of Jesus, that like, should just make us shudder. Like they, they, they should take our breath away. Does Good Friday, does Easter do that to you anymore? I was reading something today where a skeptic was talking to a friend, and apparently a true story, was talking to a friend who was a Christian and and the Christian was describing, this is what we believe, and this is what we believe, that Jesus rose from the dead, right? And we're going to celebrate that on Sunday, and he died in our place, and all this stuff. And the, the, the person, apparently, the skeptic said to the Christian, well, you don't live like your God rose from the dead. And I wonder whether we live like our God died for our sins, Paul says in Romans chapter 4, he says, He was delivered up for our trespasses and he was raised for our justification. It's a great little summary passage of the gospel. This is what it is. He was delivered up for our trespasses. Jesus Christ was given over, handed over for sin, right? And was raised for our justification. Here's what I want to do over today and Easter. I simply want to take that verse that part of a verse, and I want to try to unpack this for us, okay? I want to unpack this idea that he was delivered up for our trespasses today, and I want to look at he was raised for our justification on Sunday. Now, I feel something. When I say to you, and I look at Scripture, and it says something like, Christ Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses, I realize I have a problem. My problem isn't with the text. My problem is that I don't believe that. My problem is this, that apparently, according to research, most of you don't think that was necessary. Most of you don't really believe that Jesus Christ had to go to such an extreme, right? You look and you might think that his death was heroic, his death was exemplary, his death was the epitome of self-sacrifice, but you're just not sure that a bloody death of, of, of the God-man Christ on a cross was needed for you. What in the world have you done? Now, 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 why do I say I think most of you don't think it's necessary? Because there's been research done. Let me show you something. There's, there's, this, there's this group that does this thing, and they actually survey people in the church. So I'm going to show you some questions that are asked to people in the church, and I tried to isolate this. I want to know what people on the West Coast think, and I want to think, know what people in a major city like L.A. and suburbs think, and so I want to show you, right? Now, now, I'm not saying this is you. I'm saying apparently this is a lot of us. Um, so they ask questions like this. Everyone is born innocent in the eyes of God. Don't answer what I'm about to ask you. True or false? The biblical answer is false, absolutely false. I just had, well, not I, my daughter had grandkids. I can't have children, but, um, <laughs> and here's what the Bible says about them. They were born in iniquity, and we tend to think they're so innocent and so pure, and the Bible says, no, there is something that if left to themselves in their heart, a seed there, that is, they are not innocent in God's eyes. But 82% apparently of us believe that's a true statement. Or it asks questions like this, everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. Is that true or false? Don't answer. <laughs> it, is, it is, everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. False. 
There is no one righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And yet, apparently a full 68% of us agree with that. One of the last questions I'll give you this is, even the smallest sins deserves eternal damnation. And this is where I think we have the problem with Good Friday. Because 78% of us think that that is a false statement. My sins don't deserve what Christ did for me, right? You see the problem? Christ was delivered up for our trespasses, but I'm not sure I see that. I I love documentaries. I know that's a big transition from what I was just talking about, but... (laughs) If you haven't seen it, there's a great documentary called The, the, the Rescue, and it's about these, maybe you've seen it, it's the one about the 13 Thai children, the soccer team that went out on just, you know, they were having fun together, they all went on this excursion, they went into a cave, and they are trapped in this cave because there's a flash flood that comes, and, and, and they're doomed. I mean, they're going to die. There's no way out. They send in trained Thai Navy SEALs to try, and the, one of those Navy SEALs dies. They cannot figure out a way to, to you know, combat the rushing torrent coming through this cave to get back to these these kids that are just, you know, very, very far back in the cave. Until some nerdy guys from around the world, who apparently this is what they do with their life, is they like to go in caves and go cave diving, decide this is what they're going to do. And they go and they dive. These these ordinary men who try to concoct this idea of how we can maybe get back to these kids and they rescue them. Okay, well, I'm going to spoil it for you. They rescue all 13 kids. It's an absolutely incredible story. And I watch that, and I'm like, wow, right? That's incredible, and I think they should get an award, and I think that's wonderful, and that's noteworthy, and that's self-sacrificial. But it doesn't apply to me. Like, they rescued them, not me. I, I, can, sit and re- I can sit back and go, that's an amazing story, that they should be rewarded, it's inspiring, it's exemplary, but I'm not in that story. So, see what's happening? I mean, I, I think this is how some of us look at Good Friday, how some of us look at the cross, right? What, 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 what in the world? I, I cannot glory in the rescue. I cannot feel that rescue personally unless I'm one of those 13 boys, I cannot feel the rescue of Christ. I cannot feel the weight of Good Friday until I understand what it is that Christ has done. Maybe you've, if you've been to Foothill before, we, we, we kind of quote this long lots. There's a, there's a Puritan by the name of Thomas Watson who used to say, till sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. We, we will never, ever taste the sweetness of Christ until we understand and taste the bitterness of sin. So, so why should you care that Christ was delivered up for your trespasses? Honestly, this is all I want to do with you tonight. I just want to try to give us a sense of why in the world we should care. Why, why, why should you care that the God-man, had that, 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 our, that we live in a world that is so messed up, and maybe my own life that's so messed up that this God-man, Jesus Christ, the perfect one, had to die in my place. Why should I care about that? Why is that not just like the Thai docu- the, the, you know, the rescue documentary about these Thai kids? Uh, Psalm 33.5 says, says that the earth is full of God's goodness. It just is, right? Walk outside. Just open your eyes. Pay attention for a moment, and you will see the goodness of God everywhere. And yet, I think we can all agree that the earth, our world, our lives are also messed up, aren't they? Like, look, I, I don't think I need to convince anybody that we live in a really messed up place. Right? We're going to see it in spades in an election year. We're going to see it all over the place. Turn on the news. We're always being confronted with how broken our world is. It is not operating the way God intended. So here's what I want you to do. If you have a Bible or if you have a Bible app, I want to show you why 
we needed to have Christ delivered up for our trespasses. What happened with those trespasses, okay? I want to show you three things. And so turn with me all the way back to Genesis, okay? And we're going to move through our Bibles here, but go to Genesis, okay? Because the first thing I want you to see, the reason for Christ being delivered up for our trespasses is because our trespassing created a universal problem, okay? In fact, what you're going to see as we make our way through Genesis here, just briefly, is that the first sin of Adam and Eve, you ever heard of them, right, was what? Trespassing. They transgressed a boundary that God said, don't go past here. So, so watch this. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It's very familiar. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. The darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of, the, of God was hovering over the waters. Verse 2, and God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw its light was good. And now here's what you're going to see. There's going to be this cadence throughout Genesis 1. God creates something. He does this. He says, I create this, and it's good. And it's create this, and it's good. It creates land, and it's good. And it creates animals, and good. And birds, and good. Fish, good. Like stars, good. Sun, good. Man, wow. It was all good. It was all unbelievably good. Everything worked together. Everything created joy. Everything was going the way God intended it to go, right? Here's what happens. Then you get to Genesis 2. Okay, I know we're moving fast here. We get to Genesis 2 and what happens? In Genesis 2, it's just really we, we scope back in and look again at, the, at the, uh, the creation of man and woman, of Adam and Eve, Okay, it's this beautiful thing, and God, God creates, he forms Adam out of the dust of the ground, then he puts Adam to sleep, and he takes a rib out, and he forms Eve, and he brings Eve to Adam, and what happens is that Adam looks at her, and this is the first song we could say ever recorded. This is now, look at chapter 2, verse 23, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. It's poetry. It's a hymn of praise to what God has done. The best thing to ever happen to Adam outside of God was Eve. And the best thing to happen to Eve outside of Adam, outside of God was Adam. Where, where, right? Where did it go off the rails? Well, watch this. Go to Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to kind of bounce around here. But go to, go to verse um, 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and keep it. So there's a garden, right? We, you know the story. And Adam, you're going to work. Why does he work? Because work is good. Work is not a thing of the fall, right? We work is a good thing. But, but I'm going to give you something that I need you to take responsibility before, before I give you a real responsibility. In fact, isn't it funny that we call, I, I know this, we don't, this is not common parlance, but, but we actually refer to the taking care of, 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 of livestock and crops and things like that, husbandry. Adam, you've got to learn to cultivate and care. I want you to do this with the lesser thing before I entrust you with the bigger thing. Young people, let me just say something. The lesser thing is always preparation for the bigger thing. It's always. Do not despise the lesser things. It's preparation for the greater thing, right? Okay, but, but, but then, so now he's in the, he's in the garden and, and, um, and go back to chapter two and, and verse uh, nine and look at this. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Go to verse 16. And the Lord commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. From the day that you eat of it, you'll surely die. Now, what's going on here? Okay, so I, I create this garden. I put, I put Adam there, and, and, and Eve is going to come and join him. And, and he says, I'm, I'm, I'm putting you here, and I'm giving you all that you need. And it's pleasant for the sight, and it's good for food, right? God never creates anything ugly. He puts this other tree. It's not this nasty-looking, ratty tree. It's a beautiful tree because God never creates something ugly, and he says, don't eat of this one tree. In a world full of yes, hear me. In a world, Adam's entire world was yes, you can have that. And yes, you can do that. And yes, you can do that. One no. Why would God do that? 
Is God mean? Because God is saying, Adam, will you trust me? Will you trust me that I know what's better for you than you know? Will you trust me that even beautiful things that are pleasant to the eyes can destroy you and your family and a city and a country and a world? Will you trust me? That's what's happening. Michael Horton calls this the tree of self-autonomy. This is the tree of independence. This is the tree that says, I don't want to listen to God. I don't need to listen to God. I want to do the things I want to do, right? So that's what's going on. We flip to chapter 3, okay? And what happens in chapter 3? Everything changes. We end chapter 2 with saying they're naked and they're not ashamed. It's not a TV show. This is them in, you know, they're, they're, they're with each other. They're enjoying each other. Right, there they are, Adam and Eve. And then you flip the page and you get to chapter three and it says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, look at this, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Did God say that? No, no. He's saying, look, he's completely selfish. You're not supposed to eat any of this. No, he didn't say that. And so the woman says, rightly, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, never said that, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God's a liar. He's holding out on you. And we've believed this ever since, haven't we? God doesn't know what's better for me. I do. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God, knowing good from evil. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. And in that moment, everything changes. Everything changes. Now the entire creation turns against them. And so what happens? Keep going. In verse 7, we read that then the eyes of both were open. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now I'm, I'm ashamed. I, I've got to cover myself. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the, cool, the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Now I've got to hide from God, and I've got to hide from you. But the Lord God called and said, where are you? God's om- om- omniscient. He, he knows everything. He knows where Adam is. I think he's saying, Adam, why are you where you are? Tell me, Adam, I want you to say it from your own mouth. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God, something happened in me. Something broke inside of me in this moment when I had this fruit. And now I'm ashamed of myself and I've never felt this before. And I, I, I don't know what to do with this. And I have to hide from you. Who told you were naked? Have you eaten the tree of which I command you not to eat? I told you. And then it said, the woman you gave me, <laughs> she did it. And he says to the woman, what, you've, what have you done? And she says, oh, the serpent, he made me, right? Isn't this, isn't, doesn't this explain a lot about us? Sin's never your fault, is it? There's always someone else to blame. We say things like, you make me angry. No one makes you angry. They tease out what's already inside of you, perhaps. I'm depressed because I, I, my parents failed me. There's all these, I want to I wanna cast what I've done. I would be a perfect angel if it were not for other people. 
Some hypocrite so-called Christian failed me. That's why I don't love God and go to church. So what happens? We go down to keep going and says, he, he curses the serpent, verse 15, 14. But then in verse 15, he says, or 16, he says, I will surely, he says to the woman, this is to Eve, I will surely multiply your, chain, your pain in childbearing. And every woman said, amen, who's had a baby in pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. This is not a desire. It's not a sexual desire. This is a desire to overthrow. We have the battle of the sexes now. Now we've got friction between uh, men and women women, husbands, and wives. We've got the battle of the sexes going on. Verse 17, and he says to Adam, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten the tree of which I commanded, you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread you, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Adam, you, listen, here's what's fascinating to me. is that What God does is he curses Eve or Relationally, Right now, this relationship that is supposed to mean something, is supposed to be a, a source of great joy and comfort and provision and all these things, now becomes a source of friction. And to the man, he, create, he, he cursed him vocationally. Tell me, if you don't want to wreck the identity of a woman, then mess with her relationships. If you don't want to wreck the identity of a man, wreck his ability to provide. Go to the point of his masculinity where he says, I, I, I find frustration. I can't be who I'm called to be. See, see what I'm talking about here? This is, this is God created a good world. And our trespasses shattered it. And we spend the rest of our life trying to overcome it. He was delivered up for our trespasses because our trespasses created a universal problem. But the second thing I want you to see is he was delivered up for our trespasses because our trespasses created a personal problem. See, it's not just something's wrong with the world. Man, I hate this. It's just it's crazy and it's broken. No, everybody knows something's wrong with me. I've got a problem. Why am I so anxious? Why am I so depressed? Why am I so angry? Why am I so sad? Why can't I stay in a relationship? What's wrong with me? Why do I need to numb this? What is going on in my heart? Why do I do the things I don't want to do? I don't do the things I want to do. There is something wrong with me. What's the Bible's answer? Look, I know there's lots of answers out there. Here's what the Bible's gonna say. It's not just because you were born into sin, into this fractured world that Adam and Eve left for us. You're not just a sinner by birth. You're a sinner by choice. Every single one of us. Paul's going to say this, right? I choose sin. Paul says, therefore, sin came into the world through one man. There we go. There's Adam, there's Eve, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. John's going to say, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no vaccination for this. No one will look at God and say, I'm an innocent victim. You sin and I sin because I want to sin. I want to rule my life. I don't want to submit to God. I want to do what I want to do. I am the captain of my fate. I am the master of my soul, right? If I want to eat the forbidden tree, I'll do it. I'll do whatever I want to do. God and nobody tells me what I'm going to do. And the Bible says you can do that and you'll suffer the consequences. And the consequences of that are death. The wages of sin are death. Now look, you can say this is a bunch of bull. I don't buy this explanation. That's fine. That's totally within your right to do. You, but you're still messed up. 
you're still messed up and you've still got to come up with some sort of alternative explanation. Our problem is we haven't evolved enough. Our problem is I don't have enough education. The problem is, I don't know, global warming. It's always the problem. The problem is someone else, right? And so what do we do? I'm trying to find the source of the problem. So I'm going to run. I think, I think what I've got to do is I've got to find somebody who will come into my life and will, will sort of heal me, right? So I've got to go find a wife or a, a husband. I've got to go find a friend. I've got to find that, that ultimate other person who will come in and as Tom Cruise or whoever so famously said, they will complete me. And it never works, does it, right? We freight this person was so much baggage and expectation. You are going to be the solution. You are the missing piece in my heart that I needed. And it never works that way, does it? I gotta be honest with you, man. I've done a lot of weddings and I've stopped letting wives and husbands write their own vows because lots of reasons. And sometimes they are just insipid. I will never let you down. I promise to always be there. You know when that gets broken? Day two. <laughs> because they cannot complete you. They cannot do. This is the result. This is why there's so many divorces out there. Because at the end of the day, look, I love Michelle. She's amazing, amazing. She's a terrible God. And I'm even worse right? Okay, well, that doesn't work. So now I run to what? I run to something. I've, I've got to have stuff. I've got to get things into my life. I, I think it's my lack of, I don't know, finances or money, or I need to get more out and more into nature. And so what do we do? The, Paul's going to say, Romans chapter one, we end up worshiping the created things more than the creator who is blessed forever. Only the creator is blessed forever, not any of these things. So that fails. Well, maybe what I need is religion. So I'll run to that because religion, what I'll do is I'll build up my moral resume, right? I'll, I'll be good enough and now God will owe me a good life. He'll owe that completion. He'll help me to sort of fix the fracturing in my heart if I'll just be good enough. And, and you realize you can't because here's the thing. God will never owe anybody. God will never glory. I mean, the, the, Paul's gonna say in, in Romans chapter 11, <laughs> that no one has ever given a gift to God that he might be repaid. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. God will never be your debtor. So we fail on every point. He was delivered up for our trespasses because our trespasses created a universal problem. Our trespasses created a personal problem. But there's another thing. Our trespasses lead to an existential crisis, if you're lucky, if you're blessed. What do I mean by that? This, oh, that's what's going on, right? Look, The Matrix was a weird movie. Some people wanted to find the Bible all through that. It's just weird, okay? But listen, there's this, there's this kind of rightness about waking up and realizing, wait a second, I'm not free. I'm captive. I'm being held here. And I'm being held against my will. Because let me tell you how the Bible's going to talk. The Bible's going to be say, going to say that you are outside of Christ, you are held captive to someone bigger and stronger than you are that you can never overcome. There really is a dark force. There, there really is a powerful entity who has trapped you and enslaved you. This is how the Bible will talk. First John chapter one is gonna say, we know that the whole world lies in the power, look at this, in the power of the evil one. And we know that we, John's talking about Christians, are in him who is the true is true in his, in his son, Jesus Christ. So, so here, here's, here's the predicament. 
everyone is either in the evil one or in Christ. There's only two choices. There's no other mediating position. You're in one of two places here, right? And, 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 and resistance is futile. You can't get out of this. You are stuck. I mean, imagine there's a prison that you're in. Like, okay, you've seen the Matrix, right? It's this, it's this thing that makes you believe that all is well. Like, like there's prisons in our country with golf courses. There's prisons that will steer, serve you decent food. And you've been given this measure of freedom inside of there. And so you think you're free and you're not. You're captive. Because I promise you, try to break out and the dogs will come and the, and the, and the rifles will be pulled out and you'll be clubbed back into submission. Why? Because you're not, you haven't been kidnapped. You're there by law. You're legally, you understand what I'm saying? You're legally inside of this prison. I love the Batman movies. There's another great transition, right? <laughs> I don't know, some, one of the, in some of them, there's always like this time when the terrible villain blows open the gates of Gotham prison and lets all the prisoners run free. Okay, that isn't, uh, that isn't being uh, legally set free. That's, that's opening up to anarchy. Because you understand, you're there because you owe a debt. You're there because, because you, you, your sin has placed you in a prison and you can't just be sprung free because if you're sprung free, then justice hasn't been done. A price must be paid. A, a debt, a ransom, something has to come to do that. And this is Jesus Christ. He was delivered up for our trespasses. So what does he do? Father, judge, I come to you. I'll pay. He can't get out on his own. The dogs keep coming after him and the clubs come out and the shots are fired and the concertina wire, wire is there and it's a thousand foot wall and there's no getting over this. So here's what we'll do. I'll pay the price. I'll be in their place. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was delivered up for our trespasses. That's a good Friday. He has delivered us, Colossians says, from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Do you hear this? There's the prison. There's the emancipation. First John chapter 3, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. There's the strong men. And how about the cross? Colossians chapter 2, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. How? By just saying, by executive fiat, you're forgiven. No. By canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands, we're in prison. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Jesus Christ was delivered up for our trespasses because our trespasses created a universal problem and a personal problem 
and an existential crisis. And he's the answer to all of that. Happy Good Friday. Let's pray. I just feel like right now some of you, some of you just really need to respond to this. Maybe, maybe this is the first time or you've really understood what Christ has done for you. Or maybe this is a time where you've never really even understood this truth. You could never pinpoint what's going on in your heart. And the Bible says that today if you hear the voice of the Lord do, don't plug your ears to that. Don't harden your heart to it. Respond to it. And the way we respond to the truth of the gospel, and we'll talk about this on Sunday, is we turn from our sin and especially the sin, the pride, the belief that you could actually fill yourself up with something else. It's turning from this sense that you could slake the thirst of your soul with vessels that hold no water. And you turn in faith to realize, Jesus, you are the one who delivers me from my trespasses. I can't save you this evening, but Jesus can. And if you will cry out to him, say, Father, forgive me. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that when he hung on a cross, he paid for every sin I cannot pay for myself. The Bible says that if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, then you will have life in his name. So Lord, I pray, do that tonight. Open the eyes of the blind. Quicken the hearts of the dead. Pull out hearts of stone. Put in hearts of flesh. So that God, we can revel, revel again that Jesus, our Lord, was delivered up for our, for my trespasses, raised for my justification. We love you, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.